Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Jean-Charles Rocher. I teach at uh, the University of Zurich, and it's my privilege to chair this uh, first panel session today with uh, three distinguished speakers. Uh, as you all know, the uh, recent crisis, both in Europe and in the U.S., have shaken our faith into the capacity of the international financial system to allocate capital and risks efficiently across countries. Today we have three distinguished panelists whom I hope will restore some of this phase. So let me start by uh, Hélène Ray, who will kick off. Hélène is Professor of Economics at London Business School. She got her PhD at the London School of Economics, where she started her academic career. Uh, then she moved to Princeton. Uh, Hélène is an internationally renowned economist. She received many awards. Let me just mention two recent honors. Uh, she was elected last year Fellow of the British Academy, and this year she received the Birgit Grodal Medal as the best woman economist in Europe. Ellen is a specialist of international trade and international finance, so we are all eager to, to hear her views on the international capital flows in turbulent times. The second uh, panelist is uh, Marcus brunner meyer who is professor of economics at Princeton. Uh, Marcus, like Ellen, got his PhD at the London School of Economics. Uh, then, she, then he moved to Princeton, where he, he has been teaching since uh, 1999. Marcus has also received many uh, awards and honors. Let me just mention the Bernasser Prize in 2008 for the best uh, European economist under 40 in micro and finance. Marcus is a well-known specialist in, in bubbles, crashes, and uh, liquidity crises, so he's therefore particularly competent uh, for this morning panel. So uh, let me finish by uh, <clears throat> our fellow panelists, Alexander Friedman, who is the Chief Investment Officer at uh, UBS Wealth Management AG. In this capacity, uh, Alex oversees the investment policy uh, and strategy for more than $1.6 trillion in assets. He has uh, previously been the Chief Financial Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation from 2007 to 2010. Uh, he was also uh, previously investment bankers at Lazar. He's a senior advisor in many uh, companies, and uh, he received a Juris Doctor from uh, Columbia Law School and an MBA from uh, Columbia Business School. And by coincidence, he's also st he also studied at Princeton. So Princeton seems to be the common denominator of the three panelists uh, this morning. So without further ado, uh, Hélène, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean-Charles. It's a great honor to be here with you today. For international economists, the world has been extremely interesting recently. And um, it goes a little bit farther than that. I think there has been some uh, major change in the uh, international financial landscape in the past 20 years or so. And in particular, um, one very important development has been what we have called financial globalization, which has, uh, which has been a very large increase in international investment positions of countries, especially among advanced economies. And this has been a very important uh, phenomenon and a very impressive one. We have seen trade in financial assets fast outpacing trade in international goods and services. And, um, I will argue that this has profound implications in the way we think about international financial crisis and vulnerabilities. So just a randomly picked country here, France. I've pictured uh, the time series of uh, external assets and liabilities of uh, the French economy since the 70s as a percentage of the GDP. And what you can see is that especially since the 1990s, we have a very fast increase, both on the external asset side and the external liability side. So just to clarify, what are these external assets? Well, for example, if uh, I have a, a French private sector uh, investor uh, holding some uh, Japanese equity, that would be on the external asset side of France. And if I have a Swiss investor holding a French bond, that would be on the external liabilities of France. 
Now, I could have picked another very interesting country, obviously. And uh, you, you see here that uh, we have the same type, actually, of uh, inflection points also during the 1990s, where we clearly see this very fast increase of external assets and liabilities as a percentage of, of GDP. Now, you will also notice that in terms of absolute magnitude or relative magnitude compared to GDP, actually, the external position of, of Switzerland is a lot more uh, is a lot higher. So you can see here that we have six times or even seven times GDP in terms of external assets, while in the French case we were only in the two to three times uh, GDP. Now, if we have these uh, very, very large cross-border holdings, so why does that change things? Well, it changes things because it's not hard to see then if you have a multiple of GDP in external assets and external liabilities that if you have fluctuations in asset prices, for example, that's going to affect your external wealth in a major way. Imagine that the valuations on external assets does something different than the valuations on your external liabilities. Imagine the exchange rate affects differently your assets and liabilities. Then you will see that your external wealth is going to be governed in a major way by this fluctuation in asset prices. In other words, in such a financially globalized world, in a world with large cross-border holdings of assets, it's not anymore really the net side of things, the net financial flows that's going to matter so much. Well, it's going to matter. It's still going to matter. But it's, it's really these gross cross-border flows that are going to be very important for the dynamics of external wealth. So traditionally, economists you know, at the IMF or international economists in general had been looking at financial crises and trying to forecast uh, the likelihood of financial crises, looking at net financial flows, and the net financial flows are the counterpart of trade balances, of current account balances, and they had not paid so much attention to gross flows. And I think this was largely justified, um, you know, in the 60s or even the 70s, because gross flows were not so important, but in the recent era, I think we have to turn our attention a lot more to gross capital flows, which become much more key to understand the transmission of international crisis. And this leads us to the idea that really we should pay a close look to what I would call the external balance sheet of countries, which are precisely this distribution of external assets and external liabilities. Now, these large cross-border holdings are very important for what is happening both in a way, and that's complementary, from a risk-sharing side across countries, but also from a financial contagion side. So, for example, if Spanish equities are very vastly held by French citizens, for example, well, you could argue, actually, this is risk-sharing. If they make a lot of losses, those losses are not only borne now by Spaniards, but they're also borne by the French investors. So there is some risk sharing going through these cross-border holdings of assets. On the other hand, as we have seen, if we have the development of uh, a large amount of toxic assets, AAA mortgage asset-backed securities that are not so AAA, in fact, and these assets are held very widely in various financial systems around the globe, especially, you know, maybe in Europe, then that's definitely a factor for financial contagion. And so how does that work, this new world? So how do we look at this external balance sheet to understand this risk sharing and, and, and financial con contagion? So I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, research agenda. And I would just point out a few things there, just uh, to scrap the surface. So first of all, uh, what seems to have been happening in, since the 1990s is that emerging markets and advanced economies have very different external balance sheets. What do they look like? Well, advanced economies tend to be long in risky assets, while emerging economies actually tend to be short in risky assets and long in safer assets. You notice I say safer assets, I didn't say safe assets after the first uh, talk of this morning. And so what does it look like in the data? So here is a, 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 little, a little illustration of that, where I've put the net external risky asset positions as a function of GDP. What, how did I construct that? 
I just took the external equity and foreign direct investment positions. So I took the assets in terms of equity and, internal, and in FDI minus the liabilities. That gives me the net external risky asset position. And I look at the G7, which is the blue line, and uh, the BRICS, which are emerging markets. And you see that uh, there has been this diverging type of uh, investment positions there, whereby advanced economies are much more invested in uh, equity and FDI than emerging markets. What do emerging markets hold? Well, quite a lot of them hold a lot of safer assets, reserve assets, in particular US government bonds. But as we've, we've seen also with Ms. Monsieur Trichet's talk, um, also euro bonds <laughs> or uh, other types of, uh, of safer assets. Now, there is one country which is very remarkable in that respect in terms of its external balance sheet, and this is the United States. Now, what I have put here is, still as a fraction of GDP, the U.S. gross asset position since 1952. So we go back, really, uh, after the Second World War here, and we add up in 2010. And what I would like to point out is, first of all, that as with France, as with Switzerland, you see this inflection point. So in the 1990s, we have a much more rapid growth of cross-border holdings. You see that they are a non-negligible part of GDP, indeed more than 100% of GDP, and you know, that's a large number in absolute, in absolute terms. And why, why am I especially interested in this, uh, in this external balance sheet? I'm going to show you the liabilities also uh, in a minute. Uh, I'm interested in this balance sheet because the U.S. has a special role. It's the issuer of the international currency, the U.S. dollar. So it's a country which is at the center of the international monetary system. So what do we see? We see that its external assets, again, are dominated by this purple line or this, uh, this uh, green line, which are foreign direct investment and equity. And there is also a little bit of debt. That's the red part here of the graph, but not that much on the asset side. Not that much debt. It's it's mostly this FDI and equity stuff. And then we have some gold, a tiny bit, and then we have non-gold is just um, banks, banking, banking loans. Now, if we look at the liability position of the United States, again, what are we seeing here? Well, first of all, we are seeing something which is quite different from the asset side. So there is some asymmetry, definitely some asymmetry between the, asset, the external assets and the external liabilities of, of a center country, of the U.S. What do we see? We see quite a bit of debt. So the uh, yellowish and the bluish line there are both debt, government debt and corporate debt. They were lumped together in my little, um, in my little red uh, bit on the asset side. You had both corporate and, and government. Here you see that if you adopt the two, uh, the two components of debt, we have a sizable part of the liabilities of the United States. And we have not as much FDI and not as much equity on the liability side as we had on the asset side. So the U.S. has this uh, balance sheet in which it's therefore it's long on this uh, risky equity, FDI, risky projects, more long-term maybe side. It's, it's long on that, and it's short on the debt safer side. In particular, a lot of foreigners hold U.S. government bonds, U.S. treasuries, and the like. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like the balance sheet of a world banker. The U.S. looks like a world banker. It is short on safe stuff, and it is long on risky things. It's a bit like a banker. And <laughs> at least a traditional banker. <laughs> and indeed, maybe that's, uh, that's the reason. It was not meant to be a joke, but... <laughs> Um, at least in the, since the 60s or, or even earlier, uh, this is why maybe the United States has been interpreted as being a world banker. The country at the center of the international monetary system has this peculiar or interesting balance sheet um, with short-term lower risky assets, especially treasury bills on the liability side, more risky things on the asset side. And as a result of this, the U.S., just like a banker, earns an excess return on its net external asset position. 
This is what uh, I, I called with some co-authors the exorbitant privilege in a much narrower defined term than the, the meaning that uh, Monsieur Trichet was, uh, was discussing in, in his former intervention. So because there is more risk or more long-term assets on the asset side than on the liability side on the balance sheet, there is this uh, intermediation margin uh, maybe that, uh, that, we, that, uh, that I call the exorbitant privilege, so excess returns. The excess return, by the way, uh, it's not a negligible thing. We estimate that between uh, 1952 and 2010, it's about, so th there is a bit of uncertainty about the numbers, as, as you would expect, depending on your various assumptions you have to do to compute these, these things, but it's about, at the, at the lower end, 1.6% per year. So this is, not, this is not a trivial number. Now, the counterpart of this, uh, of this balance sheet is the risk-sharing property in crisis times. What happens when the center country has a balance sheet which is loaded on risky assets on the asset side and, and issues a lot of reserve assets as safe assets on the liability side? What happens when there is a big financial turmoil like the one we have seen uh, in 2007, 2008, uh, where the epicenter of a crisis was really the, the United States. Um, well, if we look at the net foreign asset position during that time, it decreased massively. So there has been a massive drop. And by massive drop, I mean it's a decline of $2.9 trillion in value of the net foreign asset position. Out of these $2.9 trillion, you take out the uh, current account, so the part of the deterioration which is linked to, uh, to trade in goods and services, and you are left with really the valuation part, which reflects the change in value of, uh, of the external assets of the US, you are left with something like $2.2 trillion. So the valuation losses of the United States during the, the peak of a crisis um, is about $2.2 trillion. Now, what's, what is a drop in a net foreign asset position? What does that mean? Well, a drop in a net foreign asset position, that's a wealth transfer from the US to the rest of the world, by definition. A net foreign asset position is the assets, external assets of the US minus external liabilities. If it's dropped massively, that means that you have a massive external wealth transfer wealth transfer from the US to the rest of the world. And this wealth transfer happens at the peak of a crisis. So during the time where we would say marginal utility of consumption is especially high, so this happens it's just like an insurance payment. At the peak of a crisis, the US provides the rest of the world with a massive wealth transfer. This is like an insurance payment, and so in some research I, I do with uh, some co-authors, in particular, Pierre-Olivier Gouinchard from, from UC Berkeley, we then say, all right, so this uh, exorbitant privilege that we have observed in, uh, in tranquil times or uh, over long periods, that's just like an insurance premium that the world is willing the US to have in exchange for an insurance transfer during, a crisis, during periods of crisis. And therefore, we interpret the role of the center country of the international monetary system as the one of a global insurer. Now we go from global banker, from a global insurer. Now let me explain a little bit more. Why does it work that way? Well, if you have a portfolio which has a lot of risky asset equity, for example, so on the, on the asset side, during crisis, the value of risky assets plummets. That's really those risky assets lose a lot of value. They lose a lot of value along, along, around the world. It's not only uh, you know, investment of, uh, of US investors in, uh, in Europe or, or in Latin America which plummets. It's also the US stock market also plummets. But if you are long in equity, so the value of your, of your equity holding is really going to plummet during the crisis. On the liability side, on the other hand, what do you have? Well, you have a lot of safe assets. In particular, you are issuing the most dominant world reserve currencies. So a lot of people are holding on your safe US Treasury bills. The value of those Treasury bills does not go down. In fact, it went up, in part due to the appreciation of the dollar, in part due to the coordination 
of international investors in buying the safe haven, the U.S. treasuries, during the crisis. So if your asset plummets, but if your liabilities stay up or even increase, that's insurance. That's a massive wealth transfer that you are making uh, to the rest of the world. Just to illustrate this, I have the numbers here. So between 2007 and 2009, so the height of the financial crisis, what do we have? You see that uh, uh, I would just like to draw your attention to three numbers, the, uh, the red one and the, and the blue one. You don't have to, <laughs> to look in detail at everything, everything else. So what I have here is the change in this net foreign asset position. As I said, it's, uh, it's massive, almost uh, $3 trillion. The valuation change accounts for about $2.2 trillion. And now you see that if you look at the gross liabilities and the gross assets, take the bank loans, take, take the equity, the foreign direct investment, everything goes down. You see a negative side, sign in front of everything. Everything goes down, collapses during the crisis. What doesn't go down? One thing, the debt. Why doesn't it go down? Blue number, the government debt, the U.S. government debt. This is the only relatively safe asset during the crisis. That's what the U.S. Has, has on its liability side. That's what it provides as an insurance to the rest of the world. Just a little bit of art here to illustrate again. This is just what, again, um, a graphical view of what uh, we just discussed, the insurance role of the United States. What I have here is the heat map of valuation gains and losses during that peak of the crisis period, 2007-2009. And if you are very much in red, it means that you have big losses. So you provide a lot of insurance to the rest of the world. The US is the main insurance provider at that point. Uh, I would uh, dismiss the Chinese data because they are really not reliable, but I've put them for comparison, but I have to say they are not reliable at all. On the other hand, what else do we see in a, a little bit lighter red? Well, we see the euro area, which also has provided some insurance. That is to say, has made losses on its foreign asset position. And a little country close to the euro area, Switzerland, of course, is in there. So what are the other insurers? The US is the main insurer in terms of absolute number. That's, that's definitely clear. But what are the other maybe smaller insurers? So you have them in this, uh, in this table where you have, by class of assets, equity, direct investment, debt, loans, the valuation losses that have been made, so in net, in each of the columns. And you see that there are three insurers, so three insurance providers, the US, the big one, the euro area, and also Switzerland is there. Now, so just to recap on this, why is it that we have this, uh, this wealth transfers? We have this wealth transfer because of the asymmetry of the external balance sheets with uh, a lot of risky assets. So the countries which are long risky assets are hit during the crisis to provide insurance. And if, like the US, they happen to be also issuer in vast amounts of a reserve currency, they make a lot of losses. That, that's, that's where the wealth transfers come from. Now, is it a stable kind of uh, pattern? So as it was pointed out, indeed, this crisis has just shown in a way that uh, the international monetary system with the US at its center has functioned in some sense, and the dollar is definitely provide the insurance there. Is it something that, you know, looking forward, and I'm talking really forward here, so I'm talking really not, you know, 10 years, but longer term than that, possibly. Is it something that is uh, a stable framework? Well, I will come back to this idea about uh, this Triffin idea. So what was the Triffin dilemma in the, in the 1960s? So in the 1960s, Robert Triffin said, uh, well, you know, uh, currencies can be exchanged against the dollar at a fixed rate. The dollar itself can be exchanged against gold at a fixed rate. We see a lot of dollar holdings in the rest of the world. The demand for dollar liquidity is very high. The economy is growing. A lot of people, a lot of foreigners, <laughs> start to have dollars, and is it possible that all these dollars can be exchanged back into gold at a fixed rate? No, because the reserves, the gold reserves of the U.S. are just not enough to back all this dollar liquidity that is accumulating as the economy is growing. So that's the problem. The system is going somehow into a wall. And he said that before the, the wall was hit, and he was right. 
Now, I would argue that similarly, if we look forward, what is the backing of all these U.S. liquidities that is uh, building up in the world? Well, the backing of the U.S. Treasuries, of the U.S. government banks, it's not gold anymore. It's the fiscal capacity of the United States. And if we look at the big movements in the world economy, the relative size of the U.S. economy, the relative size of the fiscal capacity is going down, growth of Asia in particular. So looking forward, it is possible that we will be confronting with a new triffin dilemma by which the size of the, of the fiscal capacity of the U.S. won't be enough in order uh, to back all the dollar liquidity. Now, conclusions on this. If we think this is... Uh, possible indeed that we are confronted with a new triffin dilemma, then looking forward, and I, I repeat many years to come, uh, one alternative to that is to develop a more multipolar reserve currency world. How do we do that? Well, for example, developing a true euro bond market in, uh, in some guise would, be, would increase the chance of the international monetary system to become more, more multipolar and to solve this new triffin dilemma or, obviously, making more progress with the uh, UN internationalization. More broadly, I think the message here I, I wanted to convey is that it becomes more and more important to really track the external balance sheet of countries in its entirety in order to understand financial vulnerabilities as opposed to focus purely on net international flows. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure and honor to be here, and I also would like to congratulate UBS for making such a good investment into the future um, and setting up this center. So what I want to talk here is about flight to safety capital flows, and I will talk a lot about safe assets uh, in this brief remarks. So what's a safe asset? There's a classic safe asset, and I know what you were thinking. It's a Swiss franc, but what I have in mind is gold. And that's just my guiding source and how, what I think about a safe asset. And what's the economic function of a safe asset? It provides a good store of value. It's a base asset. If a bank has to delever, it has to delever into something. It has some precautionary cushion. If it wants to build up a precautionary cushion, it has to go into something. It's not necessarily a risk-free asset, as we have heard in the morning by Jean-Claude Trichet, but it has to have a negative correlation with crisis. In times of crisis, it typically appreciates, like gold does, like certain reserve assets do. And essentially, it is an asset where you can safely park your money if you have to, if you have to deliver and get out of risky positions. The second function of a safe asset is it serves as a good collateral. Its margins, its haircuts are not exploding in times of crisis. It has a stable margin or haircut and this becomes more and more important given in the light of the new regulation where everything has to be moved to central counterparties and you have to margin on a daily basis and it, you move away from OTC markets. What I don't want to focus on here, and it also came up in the morning as a reference or benchmark asset, as a risk-free asset that to say, okay, this is my benchmark. Uh, I think we have models where we can deal with... Uh, non-risk-free assets, just have the zero beta cap M and so forth. And of course, there's a strong linkage with regulation and what we determine will be the safe asset will depend very much on regulation and on monetary policy. So let me characterize what are the characteristics of a safe asset. The first thing is what matters is relative stability. This reminds me of this little joke when there are two uh, tourists on a safari and um, they suddenly see a, a lion is coming out of the woods um, and one guy is putting on his running shoes and the other guy says, why are you putting on your running shoes? There's no way you can outrun this lion anyway. And the other one says, I only have to be faster than you. And um, <laughs> that's essentially what matters here. If you look at the German CDS, so here it's a clear... You look at the German yield, you see the German yield coming down quite a bit for the German Bund. But on the other hand, Germany is getting more and more risky. Germany is getting in all these commitments, uh, and the CDS spread is going up quite dramatically. So you see that the German Bund is becoming more risky, but at the same time, uh, its yield is coming down. That's a clear sign for flight to safety or flight to quality. 
And the second important characteristics of a safe asset is that it's an asset other fly to in times of crisis. Okay, so it appreciates in times of crisis, not necessarily because the fundamental value is appreciating, because the others are running into that. Think about gold. The fundamental value of gold, what is it? It is about you know, how, many, how much gold you need for your tooth and for your jewelry and so forth. It's not changing. It's appreciated in times of crisis because others are going into crisis. And that's an endogenous thing. It's all about a coordination. What asset we are coordinating on to be our flight to safety asset. So there's a huge endogeneity there and a multiple equilibrium story. As we have typically with money, uh, it's a uh, multiple equilibrium story. Why are Japanese government bonds considered as safe despite that the debt to GDP ratio is 230%, despite the demographics is uh, so dramatically looking against them? So it's all because others consider it as flight to safety asset, and that's why I'm also willing to buy this asset in times of crisis. So there's a huge strategic complementarity uh, going on in multiple equilibria. And it has, you have to have the ability to overcome the short-term liquidity pressures. So reserves, typically, you might think are um, a safe asset. And, of course, you have to be able, in times of crisis, to print money, to issue new fiat money if you need it. And that's why you see this huge difference in UK interest rate versus Spanish interest rate. England, the Bank of England, they can print no money if some urgent need is needed to, over, to bridge some uh, financing. Spain can't. And that makes a huge difference. And the market sees that, and that's why the interest rates are so different. It's not that the English situation is so much better than the Spanish situation. Now, what I call here, and coming back to the multiplicity, I call it the safe asset tautology. An asset has the safe asset status as long as it is perceived as safe, that i.e. the other, others fly in times of crisis into this asset. It's a multiple equilibrium analogy. Of course, you need some credible defense line against some panic or speculative attacks, but it is really this multiple equilibrium aspect, which um, is really important here. And this also is a warning signal. It's a warning signal that there might be sudden radical shifts and these radical shifts then can lead to huge capital flows. And we have seen this within the euro area. And that's where I come now to the main topic about international capital flows. And you can see the euro crisis in, in the following light. You can see before the crisis, we had a lot of safe assets. All the government bonds were considered as equally safe or roughly equally safe. The spread between the Greek government bond and the German bond was six basis points at some point. And after the crisis, suddenly, the safe asset was not equally distributed in the more grossy eurozone. Suddenly, some were considered as safe, without rollover risk, and others unsafe, and suddenly spreads exploded quite dramatically. You can see before that, the interest rates were uh, also uh, dramatically different. So let me focus on the European situation in particular here, and also give you a proposal I've made with uh, some others in the Euronomics group, where we say, okay, here there might be a way out and offer some safe asset for the European Eurozone, which is equally distributed across the Eurozone and not geographically um, specialized in some areas. So what's going on right now is that you have this huge capital flight out of the peripheral countries into Germany, and what you have, you have always the shifts across borders from one country to another country. There's flight to safety capital flow, and it is going up across borders. The value of the German Bund is increasing, despite the fact that the CDS spread is increasing, and the value of the Italian, Spanish, Greek sovereign debt is declining at the same time. Now, you can also see this in just looking at the flight to safety capital flows. You can see that it was running up quite dramatically, and then there's now the big reversal. Here, what I plot here is are the German foreign claims, uh, they're just going down quite dramatically. This does not include uh, target two claims. The second thing is where the sovereign asset, safe asset plays an important role is at this diabolic loop between sovereign risk and banking risk. You have the sovereign risk going up. This 
hurts the banks because the banks are holding a lot of the sovereign debt. The banks cut back on the real lending, on the real economy. The growth of the real economy slows down. Tax revenue goes down, and with it, the sovereign risk is going up again. And they have this diabolic look. On top of it, banks might have to be bailed out by the sovereign, and the sovereign risk is going down. It doesn't really matter where the crisis starts, whether it starts in the banking side or it starts on the fiscal side. It doesn't. Uh, the, the cause of the trigger is not important, but the amplification uh, is very important. And if the sovereign is not a safe asset anymore, then there can be huge spillable effects to other assets as well. One way you can see that, if you look at the following chart, we have on the x-axis, I have the changes in sovereign CDS spreads. That's like the Spanish CDS. On the y-axis, I have the change in the banking CDS and you can see that whenever there's a quite a strong relationship, whenever the sovereign CDS is going up, it is also the case that the CDS spread for these banks in these countries is going up quite dramatically as well. So this close link you can see very clearly in the data uh, illustrated here by the CDS spreads. So what would you do if you were to create a European safe harbor asset? So the first thing is, you have to keep in mind, if you want a safe harbor asset, it's not about the size. It's not a big asset class is a safe harbor asset. You know, Switzerland is not so big. I apologize for that. Um, but, you know, you can have large movements in prices. So the problem is if it's small, then you have huge movements in prices, and Switzerland had to experience that and had to intervene uh, in order to control its exchange rate. If you're large, you have a larger benefit from uh, providing this uh, insurance Ellen was talking about. Of course, you get some premium out of that. But you want to have uh, a European bond structure which redirects the flight to safety capital flows, not across borders, but across some other dimensions. I will come to that. And you want to break this diabolic loop between sovereign risk and banking risk. And in addition, I think what's very important, and it's very important also from uh, long run perspective, you want to preserve market discipline. You want to have political discipline, of course, and institutional arrangements, but you don't want to give up market discipline. I think it's very important to have both pillars and not just uh, rely on one pillar. And you also don't want to be forced to go immediately into fiscal union, which I think is politically unfeasible. We need solutions fairly soon and not just uh, you know, in 50 years. And you want to have a proposal if it doesn't work, you can just undo it and nothing much is damaged. So here's the proposal. The solution is what we call the European Safe Bond, or ESPIS for short. You have a European debt agency which buys up for 60% of GDP of each country, uh, non-program country in the Eurozone, and issues then two bonds, a senior bond and a junior bond. The senior bond is called European Safe Bond, or ESPIS, and then there's the European junior bond, which is the, the junior bond to both assets. So if something happens, if there's a default in uh, any of the sovereign debt, it will be the junior bond suffering first. It's a little bit like in the US. What we want to have is that we want to have that it's possible that you have default without hurting the safe asset. So it should be possible to have default. In the US, you can have uh, municipalities going bankrupt any time, but it doesn't destroy the banking system. So we want the junior bond to be held and distributed across the households and not necessarily in the banking sector. Okay. While the senior bond is a safe asset that can be held by the banking sector and is equally distributed across the Eurozone. So what's different now? So I mentioned already earlier what's going on right now where there's a flight to safety movement. Whenever there's a flight to safety movement, there's all this capital moving across borders. And then this will be different. And that point in time, it will be that in the asset side of the European debt agency, the German bonds will appreciate and the Italian bonds, the Spanish bonds will depreciate. You have negative correlation because of this flight to safety. So the total asset side will be roughly the same. So this stabilizes a, a senior bond. But you can have flight to safety across another dimension. You can have flight to safety from the junior bond into the senior bond. Both bonds are European bonds. So you don't have any more flight to safety across borders. You have flight to safety across two different bond structures in, in Europe. So essentially that's the idea. You want to have another safety valve through which uh, the junior bond 
provides another safety valve through which flight to safety capital flows can flow from one bond to another bond, both are European bonds, and this way you do avoid these distortions which come through these rapid flight to safety movements. So of course, there might be other proposals we have seen there. There's a whole wish list um, of uh, issues you can raise. So I've just here uh, illustrated some, and I will not have the time to go through that, so I will just uh, give you a little indication. So here's a wish list. So you want market discipline. You would like to preserve market discipline. That's very important, I think, also especially for a German perspective. Um, you have safe assets. That's, I think, the ASPIS Eurobonds would, to some extent, do this too. There's flight to safety. There's this diabolic loop you want to avoid. You want to be able to introduce it fairly fast to overcome the crisis. And you want to do something. If it doesn't work out, you can revert it, and then you haven't damaged much, and the ESPIS proposals would allow you to do this. And you can also make this ESPIS later on, put a guarantee on the senior bond, and in the limit, you will converge to the blue rent proposal. Uh, so it's something you can introduce very fast. Once we have a better fiscal integration and a credible way of doing this, you can move more to this. But as long as we don't have this, it will be very difficult to get some, any form of joint liability uh, going. And there will be, the focus here is only switching off on, switching off uh, hidden distortions rather than introducing some hidden transfer scheme. So let me uh, conclude. So I think safe assets are very important in order to stand, understand capital flows. And that's within the Eurozone. It's also you know, across the globe, but here focused very much on the Eurozone aspects. And this requires some coordination. You would like to create some European safe harbor assets that European safe harbors also exist. And you would isolate the banks from the sovereign risk. So banks have to have some safe assets they can withdraw to if uh, needed. Otherwise, uh, the diabolic loop will get worse and worse. Also, you have to keep in mind if a a country has a safe asset, then it can conduct some Keynesian policy. Without it, it can't really do some stimulus policy, and that's, I think, also why safe assets are very important. Of course, you always have to keep in mind that you might lose your safe asset status. So you have to be very careful uh, to what extent you push stimulus packages through, because you might lose your safe asset status, and this might be then backfire quite dramatically. And as I mentioned, the ESPs are quite flexible, reversible, and it will also reduce the pressure on the Swiss National Bank to intervene, uh, given that it's, it's a safe harbor right now. Hi, thanks so much for, uh, for having me here. It's a real honor to be here with such esteemed academics and policymakers. Um, so I've been given the task of talking about what all this looks like from the perspective of an investor. And I have some slides which I'll take us through. But I can summarize it by saying being an investor today feels like being a dog. And you probably say, well, why does it feel like being a dog? Well, how many of you here either own a dog or have owned a, have owned a dog? I bet at least half. So you know that when the dog does something you don't like, you talk to the dog, right? You say, you know, how could you do this? I told you not to pee in the carpet. And you talk all rational to the dog. But the dog only hears one thing. It either hears, or it hears, and if it's the latter, it thinks positive, and if it's the former, usually it kind of hangs its head. This is a bit what it's been like to be an investor for the last set of years. Either things are or they're and usually it's thanks to our friends at the central bank that we hear one of those two sounds um, coming so what I thought I would do is uh, spend a few minutes explaining a little bit more in terms of the nuances of what those two sounds look like from the perspective of, um, of an investor there are really three themes that I'm going to touch on uh, the first is riding a bull the second is gray hair and the third is um, steroids so the first one is riding a bull, which I'm sure is pretty obvious to everybody who's watched the markets, but there's just a massive amount of volatility 
And um, most of us started investing uh, maybe in the 80s, if uh, today, you know, we're kind of in the middle of our career. And you've been in essentially, a, if everyone knows, a 30-year super cycle of some leverage, and there's been some dips. But basically, if this were an EKG, you'd look at the patient and you'd say, oh boy, we got some issues. Now, this year in particular has been uh, quite striking because we have 50-plus elections going on around the world. It's almost an unprecedented period of kind of electoral transfer. And the biggest economies, obviously, the United States, China, um, and a number of other quite large economies. And it creates this very risk-on, risk-off dynamic, which isn't really driven by economic fundamentals. This chart just shows kind of the dispersion of inflation uh, predictions. It's driven largely by politics. And so investors are really in this hunker-down mode, like the dog, trying to interpret whether the sound is positive or negative. But largely, they're investing divorced from the fundamentals that they learned over the last few decades, or at least what they thought were the fundamentals. And they've been kind of searching for safety, as has been um, slightly described before me, but they've been searching for, well, where can I hide? What's risk-free? And it's clear that risk-free in this kind of new paradigm um, is being redefined. I might slightly disagree with the concept of gold being um, risk-free. Maybe it's more risk-adjusted, but I think that traditionally they've been seeking kind of hiding places in government debt in the United States or in, say, Germany. Uh, but really, is that risk-free when you may not keep up with inflation? Um, largely, investors have been saying, well, I just don't know if I should stay on this Bronco. You remember the Bronco in those movies you know, where you've seen like a bull rider? And the question is not, can you ride this bull for you know, a long period of time? It's just how long can you stay on it? Eventually, you just get off it because you get thrown off it. And so in this kind of period of record low yields, Investors say, well, you know, where, where am I going to make any money? Um, now, you could argue that the central banks are intentionally keeping rates low for a lot of obvious reasons and driving people into riskier assets. Um, the question is, are they effectively driving investors like me into riskier assets? What's actually happening as far as I see, and I sit as essentially a fiduciary on a large pool of capital, is that the transmission mechanisms are not working as they should in the United States and in Europe, but for different reasons. In the United States, it's largely a confidence uh, issue, which if you look at, say, how corporations have been behaving over the last six months, and you talk to CEOs, as we do, to try to understand their mindset, what they usually say is, well, I've got to get through the U.S. election. I've got to get through the fiscal cliff. I've got to see what happens in Europe. And you know what, I deleveraged quite a bit, I've got a lot of cash on my balance sheets, but it doesn't seem like it's a good time to invest in a new factory. Why don't I just wait? What's the problem in waiting? Basically, the U.S. has got a demand problem. The, the demand for capital to invest is not there right now, largely because of what we see as essentially a crisis of confidence. Now, you could say, well, we just had an election, there's actually stability with the president, and we're going to get through this fiscal cliff, hopefully. And once we do, will we come out on the other side? That's a question I'd like to come back to because it relates to the longer-term issues that the United States faces, which are far more challenging than what I would call kind of the last couple of years. And these are really the challenges of demographics. And in the United States, a lot of what's happened to date has really been a transfer of private sector debt towards public sector debt. And in this light, the fiscal cliff, which the U.S. faces imminently, it's important that people and investors recognize this is a symptom. This is not the issue. This is a symptom of too much debt, and it's a man-made crisis based on the political challenges of the last couple of years. You can see just in the blue line here, which is essentially the public sector debt, and if you, tr if you look at kind of the peak as it's come down, you see that it's actually kind of increased a bit on a relative basis compared to some of the private sector debt. If we kind of cut to the chase in the United States, the public finances are in you know, a terrible position. Now, what do I mean by that? There's debt to GDP, obviously, of about 100%. But if you take the long-term liabilities of the United States, so all of the entitlement spending, and you present value it, depending on the discount rates you use, you'll come up with slightly different numbers. But a ballpark of 300% debt to GDP is not, um, is not irrational from at least the way investors look at it. So the question is, kind of why does the U.S. Um, get a pass, and what happens to the United States going forward? Well, 
I'm an American, and you know, we provide the insurance, as we just heard. Uh, I'm happy to do that, and I have a lot of faith in my, my country, uh, and it's a very innovative, dynamic economy. I think we can create new companies. Maybe we'll have energy independence. We've got pretty good migration of labor and all that. Those are all in the positive categories. But unfortunately, the United States faces um, what I would describe as a demographic challenge, which I don't think most investors fully uh, comprehend. And the U.S. isn't alone in it. The U.S., Europe, and China, which as investors we think of as kind of representing the three legs of a stool, and it's been a wobbly stool uh, for a while, each faces a huge and different demographic challenge, which at a minimum will force basically revision of the social contracts in each of those three regions of the world. And I want to spend a couple minutes on it because it really implicates how we invest over uh, the longer term. The United States in 1950 had about 16 workers for every one retired citizen. Today it's got about three workers for every one citizen who's retired. And by the end of this decade, it'll be about two to one. The baby boomers are retiring and the U.S. is facing, uh, as you know, kind of an aging population. Europe actually looks worse. If you look at kind of the oldest countries in the world, large economies today, 2011, and then you look in 2050, you'll see in, in many of the large European economies, about 40% of their population will be retired, which, depending on where your starting point is, could almost be double where you are today. China faces its own version of this, which is really, uh, I think, at an anthropological level, fascinating, and there are really a number of drivers. First, China's population is obviously getting older. You can see in this line, relative to the United States, the dependency ratio and how steep uh, the curve is. Second, the one-child policy in China is being turned on its head now, whereas it used to be you had two working adults or two adults supporting one child, you will soon have essentially a, a grown-up child supporting two retirees in China. And Chinese save a lot. Their savings ratio is about 40%. And they do that largely because there's no social net. The social net has been the implicit deal that great GDP growth will lift, in China's case, 600 million of its citizens out of essentially poverty. But that GDP growth is coming under significant pressure on two regards. First, the West, as it slows, buys less exports from China. And second, in order for China to kind of effectively shift towards more domestic consumption, which is a policy goal we all know that the Chinese government is engaged in, it has to lower the savings rate in China. And, and that's very difficult to do when there's no real social net. So in a sense, over the next decade plus, we expect China will have to engage in the construction of a social safety net, um, which will have huge costs uh, in China. So that was kind of the gray hair piece. I started off with the riding the bull. And the question was, uh, how does this all relate to the steroid piece? Um, well, I'm not going to say too much controversial on this, because I, I, I know I'll quickly get myself in trouble relative to some of the central bankers here. But what I would say is if any of you here have had steroid shots, you know you can only get so many uh, before the particular joint or part of your body um, kind of reacts negatively towards it. So you know, what do investors do? Well, they look at the, the actions from central banks, and specifically the expansion of balance sheets. And they see it as positive in the short term. Right? I mean, it's the kind of happy dog sound in the sense that it starts sending asset prices um, to a higher level so investors can make money off of that. But in the longer term, they do ask kind of the ultimate question, which is, well, what, what happens to my joint or what happens from an inflationary perspective? And we can argue where the kind of lack of full employment counterbalances that. Uh, but there is significant kind of fear amongst investors today that the unintended consequences of so much unusual monetary policy um, are, are ones that we can't avoid. And in a sense, if you look at the way um, some of the asset classes have behaved since we started maybe this deleveraging process, um, it does raise kind of this question for investors, well, where do we go and what are the rules today? And no surprise, developed market equities in particular have been ones where uh, the returns have been subpar and emerging market equities, which we think of as a high beta asset class, um, have been an exacerbated version. So the question is, you know, what do we do at UBS? Well, I can tell you that as an investor uh, who's been around for maybe a couple cycles, 
One, one thing we do is we try to take advantage of this risk-on, risk-off dynamic in a way that we didn't necessarily have to years ago. So if, if we step back to kind of what the rising tide environment has been since Reagan took office, uh, we, we saw essentially a series of blips in 87, 94, 98, 2001. But relatively speaking, we saw a rising tide environment. Today we see this kind of excessively correlated risk-on, risk-off dynamic where asset allocation at a tactical level becomes more and more important. And this is terrible for individual investors because it means for the most of the time, if they try to do it themselves, they're going to they're gonna see great wealth destruction because actually trying to do short-term asset allocation is very difficult. And it's also bad because if they just decide to hide, uh, the incipient inflation that we experience will ultimately really eat into their savings. So one of the things we do is we run this very complicated um, but structured investment process where we have about 900 experts and we look at every asset class in every region over every time period, short, medium, and long term, and we come up with what our kind of longer term views are and how they relate to kind of the current challenges. And then we do an asset allocation that we change uh, on a monthly basis, but sometimes we'll change it on a daily or a weekly basis. And we run discretionary money and we give advice off of the same investment process. And I put up here our current asset allocation just so you get a sense of what all of this noise means you know, from the perspective of a dog that's trying to hear it and figure out what to do. Basically, it means we take yield where we can get it. We look for kind of a middle ground strategy. We try to take advantage of currencies as a highly liquid way to kind of move large amounts of capital in a risk-on, risk-off dynamic. And in our case, it's worked pretty well. Well, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, we don't think there's a lot of growth in the United States. There's really no growth in Europe. When you separate out kind of the noise from maybe some of the policymakers' actions, you're left with you know, a weakening European economy and a subtrend U.S. economy and China, which we think is doing okay. And so we decided to try to invest accordingly in a short-term basis, short-term meaning a rolling six-month basis. So we look for good companies in the West that have been beaten down from a valuation perspective because of where they're domiciled, but where most of their sales growth is driven off of trends that, if you want to go back to kind of the demographic framework, uh, work better over the next decade or two, specifically in some of the emerging markets. We clip dividends where we can take them because we think there's enough juice in the markets to allow for kind of the right kinds of companies to keep paying dividends, whereas they may not actually see their underlying stock prices appreciate in a fundamental way. We invest significantly on the fixed income side. So that's actually where we've taken most of our risk budget. And in our case, we, a year and a half ago, decided that the U.S. was not going to, um, we thought, likely go into a, a double-dip recession. And we thought the deleveraging was relatively far along and that U.S. high yield was a very attractive risk return uh, asset class, and we've continued to hold that position on because although a lot of people have piled into it, as investors would tend to do today, uh, companies have taken advantage by refinancing their debt, moving it um, kind of towards a later period of time. And you know, we, in a sense, when we search for where are safe havens, we actually look at a number of the uh, AAAs that are left in the U.S. corporates and some of the European corporates and think of their investment-grade bonds as one way to kind of get a low yield, but at least relatively safer yield than we might have before. So I guess I would just summarize by saying it's, it's, it's actually in these periods of excessive volatility that good investors do a lot better than most. Um, so for us, we, we don't mind it. Uh, we think you can kind of get a pretty attractive return, but you have to invest slightly differently than you have over the last couple decades. At least that's the way we've, we've been doing it here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now have time for questions. Um, there are microphones. Can see. So who wants to start? Here. Uh, I have one question to Markus Brunemeyer, because I, maybe because the time was so short, I didn't really understand the difference between your safe bond and the traditional solution, and I think that I am in good company, <laughs> at least I believe that. So it would be great if you could elaborate a little bit, what, what's, the, what's the essential difference between these two instruments, and why do you solve 
the moral hazard problem that's inherent in euro bonds that's, and why does that not exist in your proposal? Okay. Should I answer right away? Or you can. Yeah, no? or if you... So essentially the, the big difference is there's no joint and several liability. So in euro bonds you have joint and several liability. Essentially if some country goes into debt, other country might be liable and has to bail out the country. In the European safe bond, there's a European debt agency. It just buys up some fraction of the sovereign debt from these countries, and then it can still default. And there will be investors, the junior bondholders will suffer from a default, but there will be no taxpayer on the hook. Uh, but you still have the safe bond, the senior bond, which will be safe. So this serves as your safe asset, which you don't have on a European scale right now. So the big difference then is that investors will be still, there's still market discipline because if you invest, let's say, in Spanish debt or Italian debt, you might be still concerned to some extent that there's a default and there will be a risk premium based on that, but it will not be a flight to safety risk premium. So you still have the default risk premium, which I still want to keep. That's like in, uh, in the US in the municipal, municipality bond market. You have the same thing there. You still have a signal where is the where are the problems going the wrong way, which you don't have anymore with uh, the European bo Euro bond because you just have jo joint and several liability. I think the joint and several liability is the key difference. There is a question over there. Uh, I'd like to follow up uh, on this point here. So what you propose is essentially a pooling and trenching. Uh, and if I understand right, there's no reason that this should be done by a government entity. I mean, couldn't like some investment bank uh, do so? And if so, why don't they do it? Are they too shell-shocked after the uh, recent years? Yes, yeah, so it is, it is essentially a pooling and tranching exercise. Uh, there are two major differences. First is it's extremely transparent. You see what's going in. It's not like you take some mortgages and nobody knows what these mortgages are. So these are just sovereigns which are traded on their own. There's a market price for the sovereigns. But the bigger difference is that the safe asset will be a new safe asset, and this has to be coordinated on. So as I mentioned earlier, what's a safe asset is very much a coordination element. So there's a multiple equilibrium story. So you need a shift from one equilibrium to the other equilibrium. And I don't think a private entity can do that. So what's really important is if there's a crisis, people will fly into the safe asset. And for this, you need some, some authority with legal authority uh, to do this on a private entity like, you know, a big bank, I think, would, would not be able to pull this off. If this would be established already, then, then they could still run it again. But to organize the shift in equilibrium, I think that's not possible for a private entity. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. He's here. So I guess perhaps to Ellen, but uh, more generally. I mean, we have seen the, the, the debt-to-GDP ratio in the, uh, in the U.S. over the crisis going up from less than 70 percent to over uh, 100. And yet there has been no sign of uh, uh, strong pressure on the, on the interest rate. So is this uh, maybe somehow in a sign that this exorbitant privilege is still there? Is this a sign that uh, there is a r still strong confidence on the fiscal capacity, as it, you were suggesting? Well, we know that at least uh, in the short run there are shadows. We have this problem of the deep cliff. Uh, we don't even know what's going to happen next year. And yet uh, we see investors to be relatively relaxed compared with other countries that have had a similar experience in the, in the last uh, uh, years uh, in Europe. So how do you interpret this? Maybe should I start? Uh, so that's a um, very nice observation. Um, so I think here um, it really ties into both um, what I, I was uh, discussing and what Marcus was also discussing, which is the fact that uh, we are in a, in a world where there are relatively safer assets. And um, in such a world, so the, the US dollar has been playing a very important role. So we are right now in a, in a world where most of the reserves are still held in U.S. dollar, and uh, it, is, um, uh, it benefits from a number of, uh, we call that externalities, the fact that uh, if a lot of other people use the U.S. dollar as a safe asset, both in, uh, as a medium of exchange in international trade transactions, but also in their reserve holdings, then it provides a positive incentive for other people to also do so, 
So if we are in a world like that, and if we are co coordinated on a dollar equilibrium, it's an equilibrium which is very uh, hard to dislodge, especially if we don't have close substitutes. And I think right now we are still in a situation in which, you know, despite uh, the long-run shadows on the uh, U.S. fiscal position, etc., um, there has been, and we have seen, a coordination on the U.S. government bonds and the U.S. Treasury bills as a safer assets, and the flight to, to safety element that is a coordination of investors there have kept interest rate low. Uh, it's not the, the U.S. dollar is not the only one in its situation. I mean, the Swiss, uh, the Swiss uh, franc is also, has also been uh, in that it's category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I maintain the safe haven situation. So we have several safe haven uh, assets. However, the U.S. dollar by its size has been the dominating one. The Swiss franc is another one. Um, so could that change? So as I mentioned, I think, you know, if we look, if we are willing to look forward for, for quite a few years and we take into account these dark shadows that you mentioned, that could change. However, if you have to replace the safer assets by another asset, which is a closed substitute, so we need a, a, a big, for the, the reason Marcus mentioned, we need, we need a big market, a, a deep market for an alternative safe asset, safer assets, and right now we, we don't have that. I mean, the closer we had was the euro, uh, and uh, it is true that uh, creating a more integrated euro bond market would would go a, a step into making it a, making the euro a closer substitute to the dollar in that respect. We are very far from that situation in China because simply uh, the yuan is really not uh, fully convertible, and uh, there are lots of restrictions, and financial market development is not there uh, still in, in China. So. Uh, due to this lack of close substitutes, I think this, this, can, this can explain why we are still coordinating on, on the dollar and why uh, the interest rates have been remarkably low. Thank you. There was a question over there and then here. I have a question to Hélène uh, Ray and another one to Marcus Brunemeyer. So the, the question to, to Hélène is, I understand your wealth transfer argument and insurance argument from a dollar point of view. But uh, given that the dollar depreciated quite substantially, so what is this wealth transfer position? How does it look like from the other side, from, from a, a bondholder who is seeking another currency? So um, I have a problem with this dollar fixation of, of the, the, the numbers. The question to Marcus Bronemeyer is, so suppose we had introduced this system 20 years ago, or we, we are thinking of... Uh, 20 years ahead. We have a lot of this now risk uh, asset, uh, European uh, bond asset. What mechanism guarantees that we then don't have a double size of, uh, of, of, of debt? Because then investors say, okay, we have fine, we have now new risky assets, we can take more risk and we invest and invest and invest in the junior uh, bonds. And then we have the, bank, uh, the, the, the problem again, the systemic bank, bank uh, but on a higher level. So let me start with uh, the value of the dollar. So you are right that we have been seeing on the long run a kind of trend, actually, real depreciation. This was also mentioned by Monsieur Trichet. However, if you look during the crisis time, and particularly so the whole period I was focusing on, which is the, the peak of the crisis, 2000, end of 2007, uh, 2009, or 2008, Q4, the dollar has been appreciating during the peak of the crisis. And, and this is a pattern you see. Um, you, you have been seeing during the crisis as risk aversion has gone up, as financial turmoil has increased, actually the dollar went up, not down. And this, this goes back to this coordination on the safe haven uh, assets, which is that people were actually holding on their treasury bills or buying more of their treasury bills as uncertainty went up. And this caused the value of the dollar to go up. Now, how does that tie in with the wealth transfer? It ties in actually quite perfectly because if you think that on the external position of the United States, all these liabilities, these safe assets, are precisely denominated in dollar, whereas on the asset side, so the, 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 the assets that the U.S. investors are holding, you have euros, you have yen, you have sterlings, all these things tended to depreciate relative to the dollar. 
Therefore, you had, a, again, a depreciation on the asset side and an appreciation on the liability side, which is, again, a deterioration of the net foreign asset position, a wealth transfer. And this happens really at the peak of a, of a crisis. So the dollar appreciation goes very well with this safe haven property of the dollar and this uh, kind of relatively safe uh, property of, of dollar assets. Okay. Well, thanks for the question. Um, so essentially what you have, the big problem in the Eurozone is essentially you can't allow for default because it causes this huge contagion effects. Okay, and that's essentially what you want to control. If you look in the US, if some county goes under or something happens, then there is default and it doesn't cause a spillover effects to the banking system. So you want to really break the diabolic loop. You don't want the banks to be loaded with sovereign risk. So this framework would allow you to do this. So the idea would be you put higher risk weights on the junior bonds so the banks are not loading themselves with sovereign risk. They can still park their money with the senior bond, the ASPIS uh, bond, but they don't hold the junior bond. The junior bond we want to, in the long run to be held by households directly, like municipal bonds in the U.S. are held by households directly. If something goes wrong, then the risk, something goes wrong with Greece, and the risk is just spread across millions of households, it's not a big deal. If not held by leveraged institutions. I think it's something similar if in uh, Switzerland a little village goes bankrupt, it's not uh, a big deal either. If you think about Greece, relative to the big scheme of things, it's not uh, a large country. So in the long run, what's crucial is to have the risk weights, the Basel regulation adjusted this way, that the junior bonds have a high risk weights, the senior bonds have zero risk weights. If you think back, the whole European framework was inconsistent in a sense that you had on the one hand you have the no bailout clause, which means, oh, it could be that there will be default, and we want this default in order to have market discipline. On the other hand, you have zero risk weights, which said, oh, that's actually risk-free, it's a safe asset, there will be no default. So this essentially is not consistent with each other. In this framework, it would be that the senior bond would be risk-free. It would also get the zero risk weight, but the junior bond would not get it. And this way, you bring the junior bond out of the banking system, and then you can have default because it's not held by leveraged institutions, and the contagion effects would be switched off. Thank you. We have a question here. Question for Alan Ray. I noticed one big, uh, well, one small, very bright green spot on your map, and that was the UK. Uh, you didn't address and I was wondering why that was and whether the answer is as simple as that it's the only G7 country that was able to devalue its currency. So you are, it was a very good observation. <laughs> you, you are partly right because this is, a, this is true that at the time when the dollar appreciated at the peak of the crisis, actually one of the currencies that depreciated quite a, quite a bit was the UK. And this had a positive effect on its net foreign asset position. Therefore, this explains part of this uh, uh, bright uh, green color that it had on my map. Another part of it, though, uh, is due to the fact that the external liabilities of the UK were heavily weighted towards some type of debt that was not of a relatively safe kind, but was of a relatively toxic kind. And as part of the financial crisis, a lot of this debt lost a lot in value. So it was really written down. Since it was on the liability side of the UK, it, it made the net foreign asset position of the UK look a lot better. Now, I would just caution a tiny bit on the interpretation of this as a pure uh, UK phenomenon, since London being a financial center, as we all know, uh, some of these debt classified as UK effectively is not UK-owned. But there is unfortunately nothing we can do with the data there because we can't track the uh, ownership of the financial assets per resident of the owners. The, all we have to do, is, all we have is the residency basis, which, you know, in that case, put a lot of weight on the UK because it's a big financial center. So if, there are these two effects there. Uh, I have a question myself for uh, Alex Freeman. Uh, you showed there's a very interesting uh, chart uh, on the impact of a political uncertainty about the confidence of investors. Uh, I'm concerned by another type of uncertainty, which is more regulatory uncertainty, especially in a fragmented system where you have global banks and uh, domestic uh, regulators or supervisors. So how does a global bank like UBS manage this uh, uncertainty about regulation, in particular the, Basel, the outcome of the Basel III uh, process? 
No, I think that's a, that's a very fair question. It's a bit like the, um, the book Atlas Shrugged, you know, the book by Rand, where eventually people just gave up. They just decided to leave because there was too much regulatory uncertainty or overtaxing in that case. So th there is, um, uh, I think, a, a tipping point, which we're not at happily, where you'll start to really see the private sector impinged in terms of the weight of regulations. But I think for banks today, especially in Europe, it's very challenging to try to anticipate what the right capital uh, structure is. And um, I guess in UBS's case, we've chosen to be very conservative and to really view as a strength having a fortress balance sheet, which is probably a logical thing to do given the strategic goals we've got in terms of de-risking our kind of our overall balance sheet. But for many of the banks going forward, I think it's going to be a period of change strategy when, when they have to confront the fact that their return on equity is not going to look like it has for the last couple of decades. Thank you. More questions? Okay, so in this case, I would like to thank once more the three panelists. Uh, there are some housekeeping uh, considerations. So there is now a lunch break, which uh, we will have sandwiches, a soup, and uh, a curry on the fest sal, which is just uh, on the door on your left-hand side. So you can help yourself with the sandwiches, and somebody will come around for the soup and curries. More importantly, uh, please be back in time at 2 sharp for the session on monetary policy and currency markets. Thank you very much. <laughs>